Good afternoon and welcome. I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon with Rita Markley, who not only is the executive director of COTS, but also my birthday sister. <laughs> <laughs> so we were both born on the 27th of September. That is 927. That's nine. <laughs> thank you. Nine Plenty squared. of shopping days left ahead to get your gift. Exactly. Two Libras trying to find balance. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. And today we're going to talk about Rita's career at COTS because she has announced and the organization has announced that she's stepping down as of the end of September, right after your birthday. Yes. And I thought we could just look back and look ahead a little bit. Okay. So my first question is, how did you get to Burlington? I was living in Washington, D.C. And at that time, crack had hit the city. There was a lot of outflight and it, it didn't feel safe and I didn't like looking between every single car when I was walking down a sidewalk to see if somebody was there to jump me. You could hear, we were the murder capital of the world. And I thought, hmm, maybe there's another place to live. And I went to the Library of Congress because I lived just five blocks away and I started researching places. And Vermont. I mean, I loved the mayor of Burlington at the time. I, you know, I'd read about Bernie, and um, it just seemed like this magical place. I came up and visited, and I decided I want to do my 30s. I want to see. I want to try living somewhere that I haven't been before, that has universities, so there's going to be good speakers, writers, you know, interesting things going on. But with the backdrop of beauty that just soothes you no matter what chaos is going on. And then what, I mean, that's actually kind of brave. And mm -hmm. I stayed, I stayed in Burlington. I didn't, after I came to college, because I, and I had friends and I created a life. But by the time I was 30, you know, you have a social network and now you're coming and recreating an entirely new one. What was that like? Well, I didn't let go of some of the old ones, but, um, it felt new, like you're sort of on the edge of yourself and you're awake in your life and your community in a very different way than I would be if I had stayed in the same place. I don't think you notice as many people. And there were a lot of, we were all young back then, there were a lot of young people coming into Burlington. And I, um, because I had always volunteered, I went to the United Ways Volunteer Connection and asked for what place can I volunteer that works with the poorest? And they directed me to COTS. And I met a lot of, when I was still a volunteer, I met a lot of people through COTS. That's fantastic. I'm and just, neighbors, like my neighbors. I'm gonna just fix you this because I don't want it to hit against your beautiful necklace. Okay. Do you know this is a hat pin from, it's the tip of a hat pin from my great, great grandmother. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's fantastic. So you were became a volunteer, which is a great way to meet people. Mm -hmm. And you went to Cots. And I went to Cots. And Sister Lucille was there. <laughs> Sister Lucille was there, and she was not like any nun I had ever met in my life. She was the opposite of your image of some nuns. Um, yeah, she was kind. She was funny. She was creative. Um, and I just so admired her and the work of Cots. Like, it was this scrappy, resourceful team of people focused on an issue that not a lot of people were paying attention to, and the numbers were starting to go up. We'd just begun to see families with kids. That was kind of new. Um, yeah. And then you went from being a volunteer to working in development? Yes. So that was your path? And then tell us a little bit more about the situation, and it, we're talking about the early 90s now, mm -hmm. and to, to kind of draw the picture a little bit more of, of the housing crisis at that time. I don't know if we, it was, the crisis was emerging, but you could still get a two-bedroom apartment for $580. Um, which was a lot on a low wage, but it wasn't impossibly high the way it is now. And um, the, the length of time in shelter was really short because there were vacancies. People could move in, and the market was small enough that even then we had special landlords we could call. <laughs> could you give 
this person a chance, please, Bill. Come on, we think they're going to make it. And, you know, so there was, so the average, I was looking at this, the average length of stay at the Firehouse Family Shelter when I first started was 21 days, three weeks, that somebody would come in, they'd be in crisis, we could find something, and they would move out. That was the average. I mean, obviously, there are people shorter, like two days, because it was an abuse issue, or, um, but the average was 21 days. Now it's over six months. And why? And for single adults, the average length of time at the way station shelter was 17 nights. And now? And now, same thing, four to seven months. And what, how do you describe what has changed to make that true? Well, I think there's more people who have come to Burlington, and we haven't had the public investment in housing that we need. HUD retreated from doing you know, big capital projects, big loans. So Vermont and every other state was struggling to sort of fill, well, how do we create new housing if we don't have the resources to pay for it? So things like the low-income housing tax credits, VHCB, but we've never really been able to keep pace with the number of new people coming in. So, you know, you get a 90-unit project, but then we have young professionals or the graduate program at UVM expands or St. Michael, so more people coming to the area. As the economy did well, the housing market suffered in a way. You know, it's kind of interesting. I was uh, reading a book and it was pointing out that housing always gets its share from any kind of great wages. So, and that the places with the least number of homeless are Alabama and Mississippi. They have ex extraordinarily low rates of homelessness. Why? Because their housing is affordable. But cities like Seattle, with high living wages, very progressive policies, they have housing markets just as tight or worse than ours. So there's <laughs> something that needs to be tweaked in the way we approach creating housing options for people, especially those who are working, you know, hourly jobs. One of the things I think that was important about the work that you've done at COTS and COTS has done is understanding that finding someone housing isn't, this, isn't the only solution to the problem and this idea of a continuum of care. Could you talk about that? Um, well, it's like life. Some people need more help or you to walk with them a little longer than others do. So um, when we, instead of just a bunk bed and a blanket and a shelter, you need housing. But after that housing, you also need health care sometimes. And not being able to take care of your health care can affect employment. Or there may be mental health issues, real struggles. And knowing how to navigate complex systems is not a reasonable expectation for many people who are working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. That's another difference. Wait, I was going to say, so as wages, um, like in Burlington, when I first started, Whiting Brush was still open. You could make $18 an hour there. That person now would probably be a security guard at the University Mall making 10 or $11 an hour. So. Wages, in some ways, flattened as housing costs were going up. That was another issue driving it So, in the 90s. And then you became executive director in what year? Back to me? Is back that what you. we're doing? Back to me? Back and forth. So Lucille got called back by the nuns, which kind of shocked all of us. The mothership, she had to go back to the mothership. and um, Take care of business. Yeah, yeah. that was... 1996, I became executive director. And had you, were you prepared to be executive director? I mean, <laughs> had you been trained? Like, what prepares you to be an executive director other than maybe going to business school? I mean, I'm not sure. Or public, and maybe public, public administration, administration yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I knew our programs really well. So I knew the staff. I knew, um, our money because I raised the money and I'm I wanted to know where it was spent and how so I did a lot on our budgets always um, and I knew 
what I hoped the organization could become. So instead of, we had a small number of housing units, but I had been doing a lot of just personally going through our data. And I realized that 70% of the people who wound up at COTS had housing. It wasn't just about creating new housing. It was, how do we hang on to the units? People hang on to the homes they already have. So I wanted to really focus on prevention, doing not just covering rental arrearage, because for 900 bucks, if you can keep a family in their home and they don't get their credit destroyed, their housing track record, they've got a chance. And then kids don't suffer the trauma or the shame of that kind of upheaval. So I had a lot of things I wanted the organization to do. And I think because I had worked with volunteers, when I didn't know something, I didn't know how to do a newsletter, you find your, oh, Franny Seguin knows how to do graphics. Or this person knows, uh, Brett Hughes used to do, and did some of our graphics. You just know people and you start calling them in. So I think you don't have to be an expert at everything. I knew that um, we needed people who were architects or engineers for our buildings, like property people, some smart finance people. So I figured that, they could be my resource experts. And then it also brought them close to the work we do because people think, oh, volunteering at COTS or Spectrum, you're doing direct service and some aren't comfortable or good at it. But there are so many other ways to help. So I had my quick dials, my speed dials, and didn't really expect to be, I've learned a lot since then. I also had no idea, <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into either, so. Well, I think if I had known back then, I would have had more caution, but. Well, in a way, it's better that we don't know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like raising children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's never a good time, that's actually true. <laughs> and then you, you go ahead, and, and I think one of your real strengths is what you're describing, is your ability to reach out to people and recruit them to the effort, and I think that one of the things you did, and you could describe this, is you built partnerships with other organizations who were working on the same or related issues. So, so talk about the, you know, Mark, Mark Redman at Spectrum talked about that in your, a little bit in some of the materials related to your retirement. But to talk about what, well, he said that you were a great partner. I mean, not only you were personally inspiring to him, but that your partnership building and you're seeing the opportunities. I missed that quote. Thanks, Mark. I'll find it. Um, it's because, so I, I donated when BCLT would have a fundraiser or Spectrum, and we were all kind of doing our, or women helping battered women. And um, I think there was a grant opportunity that came to COTS, and it was perfect if we could, for all of us. Like it didn't make sense for COTS to go alone because we do need help for people struggling with DV and COTS doesn't have the expertise, but we honor it in Women Helping Better Steps now. Um, and Spectrum Youth, we didn't have a youth shelter. So we got everybody together and uh, wrote the first Continuum of Care grant. This is in 1998. I knew it was going to be a slog because Sister Lucille lent me. I, it's this portable laptops were brand new. She let me use it at my house so I could just go straight 24 hours. <laughs> like we had, you know what happened? Henry Cisneros was the secretary of HUD. A woman had died, frozen to death, on the front steps of HUD in Washington. He wanted to appear dramatically expeditious and said, I'm going to give $100 million dollars for people who can figure out a better system for the homeless. So we pull our crew together, Spectrum, Howard, CVOEO, I think was involved, CVOEO, everybody who partially worked and went for this grant and we wanted a million dollars. Never, never have so few people want so much. We want a million dollar grant. And then we, just, we had fun doing it too along the way. So we decided to keep meeting. And we met monthly. It wasn't a HUD requirement. It was because we called ourselves back then the bottom feeders. You know, if we weren't sort of watching out for each other, 
we were the ones who bore the impact of failed mental health policy, insufficient housing resources, or emergency resources. And, um, and we all, because it's Burlington, volunteered or donated to each other's organizations anyway, but we began to think more deliberately about a system of care and who could bring what to the table. And that became what is the continuum of care now. Suddenly HUD wanted us to have it. Like, ours grew organically, because it's Vermont. Mm -hmm. And then Henry Cisneros came, didn't he? Or yeah. Did, yeah. To look oh, it yeah. over. I think we have How that. How do you remember that? Well, we yes. have it in our archives. Actually, there's pictures of you with him, but we also, we have video of, of that trip. Um, he was so handsome. He I was. remember. Yeah. So if reflecting now on the strength of the institutional partnerships, how would you describe them today? The continuum of care and how the organizations work together. I think now they're really tight, especially following COVID. But, um, you know, I will say HUD and HUD requirements, administrative burdens, state, thing, state put a real strain on it because what had been voluntarily coming together and setting, we used to be able to set our own priorities. That's why mm -hmm. we all agreed Spectrum needed, am I running out of time? Am no, I oh. no, um, not at all. Because I can just go on and on. No, but no, no. we knew Spectrum needed a youth shelter. We knew that, the, the, that mentally ill people who were uh, in more acute crisis than what we could handle needed a place, and we created Safe Haven. And we would sit around the table and sort of, by the demographics, look at what was the need and choose it. It wasn't my organization gets this, yours. It was what did this system, what do we as Chittenden County, Burlington need? And then HUD started requiring, you have to have this kind of database with these, and uh, we're gonna make chronic homeless the priority. Our philosophy was never to cannibalize, put one vulnerable group and set them against another. And HUD under Clinton started chronic homeless, chronic homeless come first. That's 15% of the population. And back then it meant that term, you have to be over 65, have been homeless for 24 months, and they basically took away the ability of communities to really plan what was the priority because you wouldn't get funded. Um, and there, I, I don't know, there was a lot of strain and administrative burden and it became, it did become kind of difficult. And there was also a push to include more people, which was good, but at the same time, if you have a decision-making body and not everybody is equally invested, the decisions and votes, you know, can sometimes not be ideal, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so that has gotten better. And the relationships, despite all the HUD requirements, because there are far more, I mean, it's astonishing what they require. We don't even receive that money anymore. It's just so onerous and prescribed and it's, the very place where we used to be creative, that table is now almost where innovation goes to die or gets choked. Um, but everybody there is wonderful and has good intentions. It's more the pressure and structure overlaid. So what happened is outside that table, we all still talk, get together. And during COVID, um, everybody, it was like the early continuum days. We met every single afternoon, Mike Monty, me, the, the whole gang, Mike, uh, Mark Redmond, everybody. What's going on? What do you need? Helping distribute and allocate uh, protective gear that pe one person didn't have. COTS was the depot because we never shut down. So people could come and pick up things. But yeah, that felt that. So now it's really, I mean, it's closer than it's been in a while because the warmth and the flexibility hasn't been, it's still there for a certain grant, but we remembered all the other things that put it. So when you think about leaving your position, will you miss that? Will I miss the people? Oh, yeah. And I'll miss the brainstorming, and I'll miss the debating. I mean, we used to have really wonderful, I don't know, arguments, debates, where we would actually refine positions based on what we were hearing or the data. And um, I always learned 
a lot. Like you think you know because you've read this or that, but then you go to the table and you hear from the person at Women Helping Battered Women, they have an entirely different perspective on um, something. So yeah, I'll miss that. And I'll miss, I'll miss Cot staff. We have the most amazing, talented, creative, and they're funny. We laugh a lot, even though it's hard work. There's a lot of uh, irreverence and humor there. Well, you come to it with such an open heart, even after all this time and such difficult work, that I think I can imagine that the staff does enjoy working together and working under your leadership. Um, tell me, Wait, can I tell you something yes. cool? Yeah. We also celebrate successes. So listen, in the past 18 months, the past 18 months, we have been able to get housing for 143 households that didn't have, that were in emergency shelters or emergency motels, 143 in the past 18 months. And when you look at our vacancy rate and how difficult and cumbersome our system is, especially when people couldn't even go look at units with COVID. So we celebrate that. Or 14 people just this past month got housed. So there are, even though the numbers keep climbing, there are also some amazing victories. And you know, looking back again over three decades, what else stands out for you as some of those accomplishments you're, that you're pleased about? Um, a long time ago, now they're standard, but we got uh, a donor to fund a risk guarantee pool because my staff were getting really frustrated. No landlords, we're going to lose Section 8, they're going to go back to D.C., the subsidies, because no landlords will take them. And, um, Instead of, you know, the landlords and the enemy, we invited some in and talked to them and said, what, what would it take? You know, and some said, well, I can afford a risk on a tenant in one unit, but otherwise the cost of an eviction or this or that. So instead of it being, oh, bad landlords, things, the sky is falling, what we do is try to focus on the fix, what would fix it. So then we got into the numbers. Well, how much does an eviction cost? How much does uh, damage typically cost? Worst case scenario. And then they, I don't know, six, seven thousand dollars. Well, what if we held money for that unit for 18 months, a year and a half, like an audition? And then if at the end of the year and a half nothing happens, they become a regular tenant. But you've had the chance to test it out, no risk. And um, a lot of them agreed. And that began the first risk guarantee fund for housing. And people who really didn't have a chance at all were suddenly able to get into housing. And we thought when we did, when the, it was the Brenner Foundation, when, they, when we did it, we thought like we'd lose half every year, like we sort of budgeted. The best thing about it, though, is we're still like it's it was 80 we still have 80 percent of what we began with and that actually kicks off money and it's not like you've spent it and it's gone there's still a slot when the 18 months are through it's a rotating slot so somebody new gets to use it and now the state of vermont has that tool we shared it years ago with the Rut rutland prevention homeless prevention center so i'm proud of that just the thinking of not what's wrong this there will never be enough federal resources. The sky is always falling. But what's the fix? Exactly. That's a great idea. Building capacity in the yeah. community so that you can actually work around the challenges that there are, which I think is part of your creative mind. So it's just what you pay attention to. Yeah. Anything more recently that you're pretty proud of? 95 North. <laughs> yeah. Tell so, the viewers about that, yeah. So 95 North used to be the Burlington College, and it was right, it's right at the intersection of North Street and North Avenue, and it was pretty badly uh, worn. Like, it had a lot of maintenance and structural issues. And our day station had flooded out, and we were looking for a place. Where could we put the new day station? And we're always looking for housing. And when that went on the market, we jumped, and it was a way to get out of um, a difficult office program space on North Winooski Avenue and build something designed specifically 
for the people we serve, not trying to make this place work and, well, we can change around a door, but to design it from the inside out. So um, we bought it. We worked on planning. We always talked to the people we serve. What would they want in a day station? And showers, washer dryer, heavy duty washer dryer so you can dry a tent or a sleeping bag. And we've got all of that on site, plus 14 units of deeply affordable housing. And um, the biggest homeless prevention initiative in Vermont is the Housing Resource Center. That's our program. That's right there. And we have a model, it's an aspirational housing model, where often with federal programs, you start to do well and you lose a benefit. I mean, we've even hired staff that can't become the assistant manager because they'll lose their daycare or whatever. So we built in a subsidy so that when somebody starts to do well, their rent goes down. <laughs> and we can bring it down to the equivalent all the way of $200. So you want to take a train, you finish a training class, you whatever. And the test of this idea got interrupted by COVID, but we're kicking, we, I mean, we still subsidize, but what was possible was very different for two years. So now we're starting to, so it's like a, schol it's like a scholarship. So we don't, I mean, we're not violating the federal rules if they have a housing thing, but they get they get assistant to cover the... It creates incentives rather yeah. than the opposite, which it sounds like is the structure of the federal aid at this Some point. Some of it, yeah. It's that whole benefit cliff, I'm sure, yeah. So, and so it's to aspire. What would you do? What would you want to be? Like, um, it's that poem, the warmth. What would I grow to be or become in the warmth of other suns? By, I think it's Langston Hughes. And... If you've always had to tread water the way you think, your life is very narrowly circumscribed. But if suddenly you have a little bit of relief and you have 50 hours extra a week, maybe you could get a secondhand car. Maybe you could. I mean, suddenly things seem possible. So we put no requirements on it. You don't have to spend it on housing. You don't have to be sober. It's just like we're just going to see what happens. And so far it's pretty promising. So. I'm proud of that. So now that you're, you decided to wrap up as being the executive director, um, I wonder what, I mean, you, we talked a little bit about the, the, the people that you'll miss. And are you going to continue this kind of work? I can't see that you would not stop being passionate about social justice and equity ever. But what do you see, you know, just talk a little bit about this transition before we wrap up for you. Well, first, because this has been the most exhausting two years ever in three decades, in 30 years, it has been the hardest, just so stressful with COVID and quarantine and, out, I mean, just horrible. Uh, so I'm going to take a long winter's nap, as I told you, and then kind of see what feels right. So maybe... I'll take classes at UVM, classes and things I didn't have a chance first time around, like astronomy. Um, but in terms of social justice, in some ways, I'll be more free to say things that I couldn't as the executive director of COTS. And that will be really interesting to see, you know, where I want to do advocacy. And what do you hope for in the next executive director? What would you say to them as they come in, or what would you say to the board as they're looking? That we keep that focus on the solution, because there's always going to be problems, and that keeps you in the right now. But have your eye on the world or the way you want it to be. Um, to be brave and willing to take a stand when everybody else thinks, like chronic, thinks something is a good idea to speak up and not in a disrespectful way, but to have, have the courage to speak up and not just go along. Um, and to hire really talented, creative people to help. I mean, part of an organization being innovative or having a good board 
is the energy that you create. And that's done by what you pay attention to and results. So when 95 North was just a dream and there are people who now work in it, or the idea of what do you mean you're going to pay rent for people who didn't, and you actually launch a very large prevention fund, those things are because you feel that you have volition over what can sometimes be perceived as an intractable problem. So somebody who's able to keep that, I don't know, that energy and the, the ideas. What's the best defense against a bad idea? A better one. So focusing on the better ideas or the kind of getting the kind of staff and board and volunteers who generate them. Thanks so much for speaking with us, Rita Markley, and thanks for your 30 years of service. And you're not, you're not dead. So. I know I haven't moved to the. Yeah. <laughs> so we're we're I'm gonna not, we're not going to treat you like we're this is a eulogy. But I just want to thank you so much. You've always been such an inspiration for me. We were neighbors too. We're not just birthday sisters. Yes. Our yeah. the fountain days. Yes, we actually we had many things overlapping. Fontaine. But that's why it's been great to live in Burlington and grow up in Burlington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks for watching. We've been talking with Rita Markley, and Rita is retiring executive director at COTS. There's nothing retiring about her, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's She's true. She's like right out there, man. <laughs> well, that's so